After they firmly strapped us in, I took a moment to relax and enjoy the final minute of Earth's gravity before takeoff. The rookie in the seat next to me looked worse for wear, with pearls of sweat covering his pale face. He'd seemed so excited only moments before, but I couldn't blame him. The little blue planet had been his home, and now he'd leave it, never to return. First time in space, right? I chuckled, trying to keep the mood light. He nodded his eyes still fixed at the control panel in front of us. I'd like to tell you that the acceleration would knock you out clean, but that ain't the case. Lying in that position, blood is basically forced into your brain. You'll be awake to feel each bump on the road, I said cheerfully. That little tidbit of information seemed to break his trance. He looked over at me and cracked a weak smile. I could have given him words of comfort or told him it wasn't that bad. But from experience, I knew that facetious humor would best aid our journey into space. I'm not worried about takeoff. It's just him. The magnitude of it all, you know? The countdown sequence started, and I braced myself while the rookie desperately tried to control his breath. Time to say goodbye, kid. I yelled at him. Don't listen to him, the pilot said. You'll love it once we break out from the Earth's atmosphere. Here we go. The shuttle shook violently, rocking us back and forth in our seats. The rookie kept his eyes firmly shut in anticipation, with his arms firmly clenched on the armrests. Before long, our spacecraft had taken off from the ground and started shooting up towards the vast sky above. It was a slow start as the engines worked their way towards maximum acceleration. It was an intense feeling of both horror and excitement as our bodies tripled in weight, firmly locking us in our less than comfortable chairs. From takeoff to space itself, about nine minutes would pass. Each one would feel like an eternity on its own, as the shuttle accelerated from its standstill to 17,500 miles per hour. Observer, you have cleared the tower. Launch Control notified us over the radio. Appreciate the info. I didn't realize we'd started flying. The pilot joked as he looked over the control panel, making sure none of the warning lights had greeted us with their flashing alarms. As far as the works on the ground were concerned, we were on a routine mission. According to any official document, we'd be staying a week in space before dropping back to Earth, landing gently in the massive deserts of Kazakhstan. In reality, our mission would take us much further away from home, and years would pass before any of us ever had the pleasure of returning. What followed were five minutes of intense shaking. If I hadn't known better, I would have believed we'd been thrown into a dryer as clothes rumbling around in circles. I wondered what kind of unexpected bruises I'd find once we finally reached the base. The rookie finally opened his eyes. I couldn't hold his nerves against him. He hadn't seen the best part of our journey yet. The magnificent view of Earth as we drifted away, weightless in space. Observer, prepare for staging. Launch control suggested through the radio. With that message, we were launched forward into our seats. Noses pressed hard against the smooth glass of our helmets, almost touching the control panel inches ahead. A loud clunk sounded through the shuttle as the strap-ons finally detached from our ship and the secondary boosters were activated. Minutes later, we'd entered orbit, and the three of us finally relaxed while we awaited the third stage. Being free of Earth's harsh gravity was a strange sensation. As a larger man, it made me seem so insignificant as if my mass meant nothing against the empty vacuum around our shuttle. It felt like falling, except there was nothing left in the universe to fall against. Total freedom. Hey Daniel, check it out. The pilot said as he let go of the checklist in front of the rookie. There it hung, gently rotating in a weightless state. Only seconds before the third stage would begin, officially starting our journey towards the moon. As we left our payloads behind, the escape tower was jettisoned out. For the first time, we had an unobstructed view of the infinite darkness ahead of us. Millions of stars greeted us with their full glory. Without the filters of Earth's atmosphere, we could see as far as space reached. There, in the distance, hung a white celestial body, seemingly small and insignificant. Unknown to the general public, it would be humanity's final hope. We were moving towards it at an almost impossible speed, yet it barely felt as if we were moving at all. Beautiful, ain't it? I asked. At least the rookie seemed less panicked. 
Without the literal weight of Earth's gravity to keep him pinned down, he could finally just sit back and enjoy the trip. Wow, I, I don't even know what to say. It's, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He said. He spent the next few hours just staring out at space, still not willing to believe he'd actually made it there. The rookie couldn't even have been out of his 20s, yet he'd been specifically recruited for a lifelong mission on the moon itself. Tell me, was it worth it? I asked. Was what worth it? Leaving everything you've ever known behind. To have the company fake your death and erase your presence from Earth. Also, you can spend the next decade in a secret base hidden away from mankind. I mean, you don't even know what the job is, do you? He turned his attention toward me, finishing his staring contest with the universe. He pondered for a moment before finally responding. All my life, I wanted to make a difference. To be one of the few to ever venture into space. To advance science. When the company contacted me, they didn't even tell me where I was going. They just said I'd be saving the world. He was smart, good physique, and socially intelligent. He could have had a fantastic life back on Earth, started a family, made a shit ton of money, and just enjoyed all the luxuries home had to offer. Yet he chose to help, knowing he'd never return. I knew then he was someone I could trust. The trip towards the moon would take about three days, leaving us plenty of time to get properly acquainted. I'd been tasked with picking him up from Earth, and based on the file they gave me on him, he was nothing less than a genius. Sleeping in space was oddly comforting. There are no uncomfortable positions when floating without ups or downs, no limbs to lie on top of, no need to roll around. Other than that, the trip to the base was fairly dull. The planet we left behind faded away into the distance, turning into a little pale dot. The base we were heading towards had been named Ares. It was a massive construction on the dark side of the moon, out of view from the people back on Earth. Ares was the greatest creation of mankind, one kept hidden for decades, known to only 200 people living there and a handful of people situated back on Earth. When there, we had close to no radio contact with ground control. According to command, the less contact we had with Earth, the less likely that our operations on the moon became public knowledge. As we were taken in by the moon's orbit, we started hearing static feedback. Before long, we'd be in contact with Ares itself. This is Observer 108 to Base Control. Do you copy? Greetings, Observer. This is Base Control. We read you loud and clear. Station 7 is ready for docking. Get ready to initiate landing sequence. I pulled out another checklist while the pilot flipped around necessary switches. Within a minute, we were approaching the docking station. The landing was smooth, and once the airlock opened, we finally got a chance to stretch our legs. We were immediately greeted by a decontamination crew and ordered to change out of our sweaty undergarments and into more suitable uniforms. It's been a pleasure, Rick, the pilot said to me as we parted ways. It was time for the rookie's initiation into the system. I brought him to the sectional office, looking for his instructor and guide, Jennifer. Rick, how are you doing? Jennifer asked as she stepped out of the office. Uh, just bringing you our newest scientist. Uh, mind if I stick around? Make sure you don't go too hard on the kid? She smiled and gestured for us to follow her through the narrow halls of Section 7, as she explained protocols and rules around the compound. It was an impressive construct, a station big enough to comfortably house hundreds of people, in addition to the countless laboratories, workstations, and massive common areas for the large amounts of downtime. The fact it had been kept hidden for so long was an almost impossible feat on its own, one that had piqued Daniel's interest. Mind me asking how and why this has been kept a secret for so long? Jennifer smirked. It was a question inevitably asked by each newcomer, one she knew exactly how to answer. Ever heard of the Manhattan Project? Yeah, the race to build the atomic bomb back in 1939. Daniel responded confidently. 130,000 people working together to create the most destructive weapon in human history, divided into hundreds of sections each working on their part of a bomb to be dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Out of these 130,000 people, only about a couple of dozen knew what the project would result in. The rest were kept in the dark, unknowingly causing the death of countless people. That's... Exactly how the Ares Project was kept hidden, by giving each station a piece of the puzzle. 
just not enough to see the whole picture. I always loved listening to Jennifer's speeches about the Ares Project. The look of surprise and amazement as they realized the magnitude of the situation. But one final piece of information still strayed away from Daniel's knowledge. So what exactly are we doing here? He finally asked. Before Jennifer got a chance to explain, the speaker system emitted a loud and jarring message. Security head office calling Richard Fender. Report to section 9 immediately. Jennifer and Daniel looked at me questioningly. Uh, sorry, I'll catch up with you later. I said as I started rushing down the hall. The act of running on the moon was a peculiar experience. With only one-fifth of Earth's gravity, you spend more time gliding through the air before each step hits the ground. In a way, it feels like flying, and you can reach speeds higher than what would be possible back home. On the other hand, without ground contact, it's hard to maneuver around corners, which is why Ares has been built almost exclusively with straight hallways. Within a few minutes, I'd made my way to the head security office. Inside, I found a whole crowd of guards and officers all frantically trying to yell over each other to make a decision. What's going on? I asked. My supervisor, Lance Henderson, took me to the side to fill me in. Rick, something landed next to PAW Station 12. It doesn't show up on any of our instruments, but the crew swear they saw it. Particle Accelerator Weapon, Station 12, was the furthest reach away from the main base, situated near one of the major craters. It was the last of the set of cannons aimed into deep space, weapons so powerful they could deflect any meteor getting too close to Earth. What are they saying about it? We don't know. We lost contact with them not 15 minutes ago. I need you to take a team out to the station and find out what the hell's going on. I made my way to the hangar, a massive structure situated partially underground, doubling as the main oxygen production facility. The moon's crust is naturally rich in oxygen, and by converting the rocks, we effectively produced and maintained an atmosphere within the station. Three of my colleagues, Derek, John, and Patrick, met me by one of the buggies, all wielding rifles. It wasn't a large team, but with the few trained guards we had at the station, the rest would stay behind. If something happens to us, the protocol was to lock down the entire Ares facility and abandon anyone trapped in the smaller stations. Station 12, this is Buggy Zalit. Do you copy? John kept repeating as we endured the uncomfortable hour-long trip. It felt like an eternity passed before we reached the station. It was a large construct with the particle weapon towering up from the ground, staring off into deep space. In front of the station lay a large, diamond-shaped rock covered in what looked like massive blisters some of which had ruptures. What is that thing? John asked. I don't know, but keep your weapons ready. There were still two buggies parked outside the station, meaning that the crew couldn't possibly have left. Station 12, we are entering through the main airlock. Get ready for boarding. I said as we manually unlocked the front gate. We kept our helmets on, even as the airlock was pressurized and we could breathe. We didn't know what we could expect on the other side, so we had to be ready for a quick escape. We stopped dead in our tracks as we took our first steps inside. There, on the floor, lay the entire crew of PAW-12, dead and mutilated to various degrees, with no sign of any other creatures. It didn't look like monsters had come in to murder the crew, but as if they'd simply decided to kill each other, using whatever they could as weapons. Some of their wounds were created with surgical precision, slit throats, stabbed heart, or crushed skull while others were more morbid, as if they'd taken their time to finish the kill. The only discrepancy among the murdered was a man zip-tied to the wall in a corner, some distance away from the others. While his neck had been stabbed, it didn't look like any major vessels had been injured. As I bent down to examine the tied-up man, he suddenly <gasps> jolted awake, screaming in horror. No, no, stop it! Get out! I don't want to! I grabbed him in an attempt at keeping him still, worried he might exacerbate his injury. Calm down! Calm down! You're safe! I kept repeating. His fear quickly turned to despair as he noticed the corpses littering the floor in front of him. I'm sorry! I'm so sorry! I didn't mean to! He cried. I grabbed a sedative out of my kit and injected him through his port, hoping he'd remain conscious but at least calm enough to relay what happened on board the station. I read the name on his suit. Frederick. Hey, Frederick! Look at me. I need you to tell me what happened here. He calmed down a bit following the injection, but then he looked carefully around the room as if he was recounting the events that had transpired. I tried to kill myself. I, I, I don't know why. I didn't want to, but, but the voices... Oh, 
Oh God, the voices. They just, they just kept telling me I had to do it. They were so loud. My, my team, they pinned me down and tied me up, but it didn't help them. I'm so sorry. He sulked, still breaking down. I looked back at the dead crewman littering the floor. If they'd managed to tie him up before he died, then who'd killed them? What about the others? They just started killing each other, but it wasn't them. The, the things, they, they changed them. They made them do it. His rambles were only semi-coherent, but the last statement piqued my morbid curiosity. Who? For the, the things, they came from the vessel. We didn't even see them, they, but they were there. They got inside our heads and made us do it. I'm sorry, please, please, you gotta believe me. He kept rambling for a couple of minutes. I gestured for Derek to put him to sleep. He would only make things worse by panicking. If we stood even the slightest chance of bringing him back safely to the station, he had to be put out. Don't worry, Frederick. We'll get you out of here, I promise. Within a minute, he was out, and we brought in a stretcher to carry him out. The rest of the crew were a lost cause, too destroyed to even fit into their suits. We had no choice but to leave them behind. We boarded our buggy and immediately got a transmission from the main bases. Buggy Zealot, do you copy? Yeah, we made contact with Station 12. There are multiple casualties, but we're bringing back a survivor. Prepare the medical bay. Buggy Zealot, we've lost contact with Stations 4, 6, 8, and 9. We're reading multiple heat signatures on the surface. Return to Ares immediately. Wait, what's happening? There was a brief pause while I waited for the next transmission. Are you there? Then, they said the words I've dreaded the most since I was assigned to the project. A simple sentence that I thought was years away from ever coming true. They're here. We tied the injured crewman to our buggy, making sure he wouldn't slip off as we sped back to the base. What do you mean? How can they be here already? John asked over the radio. No response. Ares? Driving on the moon wasn't an easy task at high speeds. With the craters, it was a bumpy ride, and the ever-present dust increased the risk of sliding as we maneuvered toward the base. Buggy Zealot, we're initiating lockdown. Hangar 2 will remain open until you arrive, but we're putting you into quarantine. Understood. We'll be there in ten minutes. I nervously scanned the horizon, looking for any sign of movement. Whatever creatures had been inside these pods, they had killed the entire crew aboard PAW Station 12. We saw more of them on the way. Each of them were diamond-shaped, obsidian black containers made out of bizarrely shiny material. They were covered in blister-like sacks, most ruptured but some still intact, pulsating and twitching. They looked almost wet, but any liquid should have evaporated immediately as it hit the harsh vacuum of space. We parked the buggy outside the hangar and lifted Frederick into one of the service airlocks. On the inside, we were met with the blaring sound of an alarm and a set of isolation capsules for each of us. On the other side of the airlock stood my supervisor. We're gonna need you all to get inside the capsules while we decontaminate the room, he ordered nervously. Lance Henderson was an abnormally calm individual, even at the most stressful of times, so to see him on the brink of panic alerted me to the true gravity of the situation. Lance, is it true? Are they really here? He nodded somberly. Not a word more needed to be said. I knew then that the next couple of days would decide the fate for not only us, but for the rest of humanity. After we put ourselves into the isolation capsules, they prepared to move us to the medical bay. Do we have any footage from the pod stations? Lance shook his head. Most of it got corrupted after the pods appeared on the moon's surface. We were trying to restore it, but I'm not too hopeful. I'll let you know as soon as we find anything. I'll link up with you soon, just do as the medics tell you. The medics carried my security team and I to an isolation room. Frederick, who'd sustained serious injuries to his neck, was put into a separate room next to us. It was a research facility, which meant it had glass walls for observation. There was no privacy as we got undressed and changed into sterile clothing. You better tie him up, he's not himself, John said as the medics put Frederick in bed. By the time we'd been put into quarantine, the entirety of Ares had been put into a complete lockdown. Anyone still outside the main base were on their own. Behind our glass walls, we could see crew members rush around in panic, each trying to fulfill their duties at a record pace. All the while, alarms kept blaring, orders were shouted through the speaker systems, and we could do nothing but wait, uselessly stuck in isolation. 
Lance called me over to the radio, briefing me on the situation. Rick, we'll have your test results in an hour or so. In the meantime, we're trying to establish contact with anyone outside the main base. If they're still alive out there, we need to figure out a safe way to bring them inside. Has anyone responded? No, but we've detected multiple heat signatures on the surface. A few of them match the crew's transponders, but... He trailed off. But what? There are too many of them. We don't have that many people stationed on the moon. It's them. I said, my voice filled with premature defeat. Yeah, we've recorded some footage from Station 12. I'll send you the files. I turned to the computer mounted on the wall and typed in my credentials. A single video file had been uploaded to my profile. A few minutes of salvaged footage. I hit play and prepared myself for the worst. What greeted us was an overhead view of Station 12's interior, only an hour before we entered. The crew relaxed in their leisure area, joking around and waiting for their shift to end. I immediately recognized Frederick standing in the corner, oddly quiet. He seemed to concentrate on something not visible on the camera. Hey guys, you hear that? The crew fell silent and all of them listened intently to their quiet surroundings. You hear what? I don't know, it, it sounds like... Without even finishing his sentence, Frederick grabbed a pen from a nearby table and started stabbing himself in the neck. Blood gushed out from the wound and the crew immediately rushed to pin him down. What the hell are you doing? Stop that! Let me go! I need to do this! Frederick yelled in protest. Get the damn zip ties! Boss, there's... there's something outside. What are you talking about? After tying Frederick to the wall, the crew gathered to stare out of the minuscule window, all of them in shock from what they saw. After a minute of disbelief, their boss grabbed the radio to alert Ares of the unidentified object. Ares, this is PAW Station 12. We found something on the surface of the moon. I don't think it's of lunar origin. In response, only static could be heard. The radio's cutting out. Robbie, would you check the connection? Without responding, the crewman walked over to his boss and stabbed him with a screwdriver. One of the others lifted his weapon in a hopeless attempt at de-escalating the situation. Drop the screwdriver! He ordered. But instead of helping, he turned his weapon on himself. Looking confused and without hesitation, he shot his own leg. The rest of the crew scattered in disarray, some trying to help their boss while others wanted to grab the gun from their co-worker. The man with the screwdriver had already killed his boss and had turned his attention to himself. He proceeded to repeatedly stab his own abdomen, crying as he did. One by one, they all fell to the same insanity. Within only a few minutes, every crew member had succumbed to their wounds. All save for Frederick, who had been tied to the wall just in time to save his life. The footage cut off abruptly, and we all stood speechless in front of the empty screen. What about the other stations? John asked. Do we really want to witness that again? As we discussed the undeniable reality of an oncoming invasion, we started hearing groans coming from Frederick's room. He was waking up, luckily tied to the bed. Where am I? You're safe, Frederick. The doc is on his way. Just stay calm. They're all dead. He sulked. We should give him some more sedatives, John said. Where's the damn doc? Ares' head physician was a neuroscientist of advancing age. The rookie Daniel would be his new apprentice. By the time the doc eventually retired, he'd take over, specifically chosen for the job. They both arrived alongside Jennifer a few minutes later. We told him what had happened, and he suited up to go inside to examine Frederick. Lance finally returned after patrolling the area. He'd lock down the entirety of our section and put guards on each airlock, should something break through. Staff was scarce, but each employee, guard, or scientist had been trained to deal with situations like this. Dr. Livingston, they briefed you on the patient? Lance asked. Yes, I'm aware of the situation, he stated matter-of-factly. Daniel, join me inside. We're gonna have to cut your training short. I've always thought hands-on experience worked best anyway. Together, they entered the isolated room. Jennifer stood guard outside, ready to intervene should Frederick fall into psychosis once again. What followed was a barrage of uncomfortable but necessary questions. Frederick, who'd attempted to kill himself only hours earlier, was undoubtedly shook from the experience, but whatever trance he'd been in had long since passed. Halfway through the examination, another alarm sounded through the base. Atmosphere breach in Section 9. All personnel must evacuate the area immediately. Lance immediately reached for his radio, demanding an explanation. Section 9, this is Security Chief Henderson. What's going on? 
Someone just blew up one of the airlocks. A voice screamed from the other side. They took explosives from the facility. Who? I don't know. We tracked a transponder from Paw Station 7. We tried contacting them over the radio, but he ignored us. Is the breach sealed? Lance asked. Yeah, but half my team died in the vacuum. The rest of us are about to suit up in case the seal fails, but I don't know- He paused, and a loud hammering noise could be heard through the radio. Oh god, they're coming through the seal. Everybody, get the hell out! What followed was a vague crashing sound before the call got interrupted. Damn it, I gotta go. Jennifer, stay here and help Doc, Lance said. Absolutely not. I'm coming with you. They'll need all the help they can get. She argued. And what about us? I asked. Sorry, Rick, you have to stay in isolation until the tests come back. Don't worry, they'll come let you out ASAP. The two of them rushed down the long hallways towards Section 9, while we remained trapped with no chance to help. Daniel and Dr. Livingston finished examining Frederick and called for our tests to be rushed through. Twenty agonizing minutes passed as we waited for any updates on the situation. The occasional bang was the only thing keeping us company, as it echoed through the outer halls of Ares. Over the radio, I could hear requests for additional security coming from various sections around Ares. It was a call no one had the capacity to answer, and I felt utterly useless stuck in isolation. Then we heard the sound of multiple footsteps rushing down the hall. Stay with me! Jennifer shouted. They rushed past us, carrying two stretchers. On one of them lay Lance, bleeding profusely from multiple gunshot wounds to his abdomen. Jennifer, what happened? I asked in shock. She ignored me, and they brought the injured crew into a separate room. Though we couldn't directly see them, we could hear the utter horror in their voices, as they futilely tried to stop the bleeding. It was a hopeless case, and from prior experience, I knew Lance wouldn't make it. Only minutes later, he had bled out. Jennifer came over to our room, staring at me through the glass. Her eyes were red from a mixture of panic and despair. Jen, is he- Dead. Uh, I- I killed him. You did what? He- he just- he just went crazy. We were investigating the broken seal, even with the hole secured. Something got through. Every single person who hadn't gotten out of Section 9 died instantly. How many? 37. Jesus Christ. She sobbed for a moment before continuing, her blood-covered hands visibly shaking from the ordeal. As we suited up, Lance said he heard something. I'd already gotten my helmet on, and I couldn't hear what he was talking about. But then he just… Another loud bang could be heard, followed by an alarm. Whatever things were killing our people, they were getting into the station. He shot the others, point blank, and he would have killed me too. I didn't have a choice. I, I had to defend myself. I only wanted to stop him, but the first bullet didn't even face him. I just kept pulling the trigger until he dropped his weapon. I killed him. It was me. I'm sorry. I I'm so sorry. We didn't get a chance to continue the conversation before the medics came to let us out. Even without conclusive test results, we had been ordered to evacuate the area. The entire crew aboard Ares were pulling back into Section 5, the central and most secure hub of the station. They're closing all the doors in five minutes. We gotta go now, one of them ordered. With no time to suit up, we started rushing towards Section 5, ready to fight whatever creatures had entered the station. I just don't understand. They weren't supposed to be here for another five years. How is it possible? N no idea. It doesn't make any sense. On our way, we passed numerous lockdown sections, all breached and their atmosphere replaced by an empty vacuum housing little more than dust and the corpses of our deceased crew. Multiple distress calls emitted from my radio, but we could do nothing to help any of them. All we could do was hope that as many people as possible made it into Section 5, where we'd organize a fight against the invaders. Rick, you there? Please respond. A voice said over the radio. I recognized the voice. It belonged to one of the senior security guards, Brandon Clifford. I'm here. We're en route to Section 5. Are you safe? Forget Section 5. We need you and the doc to come to the main lab immediately. The lab? Why? He paused for a moment, letting out half a chuckle. We got one of them. At trillions of dollars spent, Ares had been the most expensive project ever undertaken by mankind. It made the cost of the International Space Station seem like pocket change in comparison, but for its purpose, it was worth it. Our goal had been simple, to save humanity from an inevitable invasion. 
one we'd foreseen since the early 70s, one we'd spent decades preparing for. Despite our best efforts, it had only taken the invaders a few hours to shut us down. In one fell swoop, they'd shut down our entire PAW defense grid, killed more than half our crew, and next on their list was Earth. Brandon Clifford had already gathered a team of doctors and engineers at the laboratories in Section 3, but with half the station occupied by a vacuum, getting there would be a challenging task. Rather than crawling through the separate ventilation system, we suited up and traversed directly through the locked off sections. Weapons in hand and eyes peeled for enemies, we slowly made our way towards the lab, praying that the dead alien could give us the answers we so desperately sought. So they killed it, right? Jennifer asked. I sure hope so. I doubt we'd have the means of interrogating it, I responded. Besides, it's time for payback. These bastards killed half our crew without as much as a second thought, John interjected. Once we finally made it to Section 3, we were met with a set of heavy metal doors. They were strong enough to withstand the vacuum of space and able to negate the power of a nuclear blast. They had to be manually activated and could only be opened from the inside. Brandon, you in there? I asked over the radio. Rick? Yeah, it's me. I've got my security team with me. Would you please open up the damn door? An airlock separated the lab from the rest of Section 3. It had been built in the early stages of Ares construction, and functioned more as a minuscule station than part of the main project. Luckily, it had been able to maintain an atmosphere despite the many breaches. It was a massive, dome-like structure divided into several micro-labs. Each of them had been sealed off, hidden and distributed to different research teams, operating in isolation from one another. At the very end was an autopsy room. It had been used to study the effects of low gravity on the decaying human body, but now it would be a place for alien dissection. Livingston and Daniel had arrived with a team of engineers, just in time to escape the breach in atmosphere. Whether they liked it or not, they were trapped in the laboratory, without enough suits to bring everyone out. Brandon met us by the entrance. He'd sustained a massive gash to his face, rupturing his left eye, and covered by a crude bandage. He guided us towards the autopsy room. In one of the corners, I noticed a pile of corpses. While I didn't personally know them, I recognized them as the lab maintenance crew. What happened to them? I was escorting Dr. Livingston and his assistant over here, making sure none of the invaders got them. As we got here, one of the crewmen complained about a loud noise. Before I got a chance to question him, he pulled out a knife and slashed me across the face. I tried to get away, but he stabbed his co-workers. I had no choice but to shoot him. And the other two? I said as I gestured to their gouged out eyes and slit throats. They, um, they just dove in for the knife, started mutilating themselves. I couldn't stop them. He responded somberly. It wasn't until the adrenaline hit me before I noticed that creature standing in the hallway. I can't even explain it, just have a look at the thing. We entered the autopsy room. There on the table lay a massive creature. Though it had vague humanoid features such as arms and legs, they were grossly disproportionate to what would function on Earth. Its skin was sickly pale white and covered in a mucus-like substance. The arms reached far beyond its own legs, which were split in half down the middle. Instead of eyes, ears, and mouths, the head was covered in deep, dark cavities. There were multiple bullet holes on its center mass, which I assumed to be the cause of death, but despite the higher caliber rifle used, there were no exit wounds. Is it dead? Jennifer asked nervously. No idea, Livingston responded. Its temperature hasn't changed, and it doesn't appear to bleed. Our only comfort is that it doesn't show any kind of responsiveness. I looked back at Brandon, who tried to cope with his missing eye. So what exactly happened to him? I chimed in. The thing was just wandering the hallway, covered in some weird slimy film. I didn't exactly stop to ask any questions, I just shot it. Two mags to bring the thing down. I took another glance at the bullet holes. The injuries looked oddly clean. The bullets inside had seemingly vanished as if the creature had simply digested them. What do you think, Doc? Brandon asked. He mumbled something to himself. It's a remarkable creature. I have my theories, but I'd need to open it up to be sure. Then what are you waiting for? Do it! Brandon firmly suggested. Don't be ridiculous. This is not something you can just cut open with a scalpel. Its skin is too powerful. Besides, we're going to scan it first. The creature must have been ten feet tall and weighed as much as all of us combined. 
Together, we pulled it onto a portable table and slowly pushed it towards the CT scanner. Once inside, Livingston didn't hesitate to start the machine. A loud whirring sound could be heard as the machine started taking pictures. God damn it! Livingston exclaimed as the computer produced the scan. To the untrained eye, it looked like a massive flare occupying most of the screen. What's that? I asked. Starburst. It's what happens when there's metal in the way of an x-ray, Daniel explained. They put something inside the creature's head and we're going to remove it. Livingston continued as he rushed off to gather some tools. He returned moments later with an ice pack and a hammer. Without a second thought, he started digging into the creature's skull. Though the skin was immensely thick, it didn't seem to contain any bones. Before long, he retrieved a small metal box. What is it? I asked. I'd need to take it apart to be sure, Livingston said as he walked over to a set of computers. It looks oddly primitive though. Maybe... Before he could finish the sentence, a high-pitched sound emitted from the speakers. We all fell to the ground, clutching our ears in agony. Brandon, thinking on his feet, ran over to grab the device out of Livingston's hands. He threw it to the ground and started stomping on it. As the metal box shattered, the sound finally stopped. You idiot! Why did you do that? Livingston asked furiously. Why? Because it was fucking loud! Brandon shot back. Livingston collected the broken pieces and went to inspect the device. In the meantime, Daniel proceeded to repeat the CT scan, this time without interruptions. We waited impatiently while the machine circled around the lifeless creature, slowly producing a picture I didn't have the proper education to comprehend. Wow, that's in incredible, Daniel mumbled to himself as he looked over the alien. Livingston joined him, and together they threw around a plethora of medical jargon none of us could understand. After a few minutes of discussing the creature's anatomy, they started to look worried. They rushed to the radio and quickly disconnected it before silencing every speaker in the room. Turn your damn radios off, Livingston ordered. The lab was plunged into deafening silence and we all waited a logical explanation from the doctors. Sound. That's how they do it, Daniel said with a weird mixture of excitement and horror in his voice. Sound? That's how they put people into a trance. They delude people into killing themselves and those around them, appearing as voices inside their heads, he continued. Livingston kept studying the device, desperately trying to figure out its purpose. It's a transducer, he suddenly said. It converts sound to radio waves. That's probably how they communicate in the vacuum. It also means they're able to hijack our own communication channels. You think they could use them against us? He nodded. These things, they're unlike anything found on Earth. They don't have a centralized nervous system, nor do they need a heart to pump blood through their bodies. If anything, they resemble insects more than mammalian life, except every vital organ seems to be diffused throughout their entire mass. That's why it's so hard to kill them. The only effective thing to fight back would be with fire. He paused, looking over the creature once more. We have to freeze it. Make sure it doesn't wake up. We lumped the creature onto a table and started pushing it towards the freezer. It could bring things down to just a few Kelvin away from absolute zero. A temperature that could keep even atoms from moving around. We need to warn the others, Jennifer said. Send out a warning to Section 5, but keep it brief. As we attempted to push the creature into the freezer, I noticed it twitch. Before I could even warn the others, Brandon just froze in place. No, 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 no. He kept repeating. The alien moved again, not strong enough to get up, but clearly not dead. It's... it's in my head! Get it out! He yelled as he lifted his gun to his own temple. I dove into him, trying to pin his arm down. In the process, he accidentally fired off a round, which ricocheted off the ground and hit Livingston in the leg. As I tried to subdue Brandon, two of the other guards fell to insanity. With little hesitation, they grabbed whatever sharp objects they could find and started hacking away at their own bodies, quickly bleeding out. Brandon knocked me off, but the gun had slid too far away for either of us to reach. Rather than fight him, I grabbed a nearby bottle of isopropic alcohol and drenched the alien in it. Before anyone could stop me, I ignited the alcohol and set the monster ablaze. Despite being on fire, it didn't let go of the grip it had on our crew. Brandon, alongside the engineers, rushed to embrace the burning creature, lighting themselves on fire in the process. The sprinkler system started spouting out a mesh of carbon dioxide dry ice, but with the burning crew lighting everything they touched on fire, it hardly helped. Despite our best efforts, the laboratory would soon be gone. In the meantime, Daniel attempted to stop the bleeding from Livingston's leg, but it proved to be a futile effort. It's his femoral artery. I can't stop it, Daniel said. 
By then, secondary measures had been activated to quell the fire. It meant that all the oxygen would be sucked from the lab and expelled into the vacuum of space. Normally, it wouldn't be a problem, but with the entirety of Section 3 missing atmosphere, it meant we needed to suit up. We need to get to Section 5 immediately. Jennifer, did you manage to get a hold of them? They're not responding. Not having time to come up with a better plan, I rushed to get suited up with the rest of the crew. We only had two minutes before the oxygen levels dropped to fatal levels. Wait! Livingston called out. His face had turned pale from blood loss, and I could easily tell he was only moments away from death. You have to disable your radios. It's only a matter of time before they figure out how to intercept our channels. You have to... You... It meant we'd be walking out there with little to no situational awareness, unable to communicate with each other. Despite the horrific realization, we all knew he was right. What about you? We all know I'm done for. Just go! I glanced over at the burning remains of my former security team. John and Jennifer still attempted to put out the fire, but it was far too late. How are we supposed to stop them? You can't, Livingston said, his voice growing weaker with each word. But you have to warn Earth. Give them a fighting chance. We suited up at a record pace and got ready to unlock the laboratory doors. The airlock would be sealed until the fire went out, which meant we had to watch Livingston suffocate before we could even walk outside. Jennifer grabbed a paper-sized whiteboard, allowing us to communicate even without a radio contact. But the thought of going out there deaf still terrified me. Don't let this be for nothing. Livingston gasped as the last bit of air got pumped out of the room. Seconds later, he fell silent on the floor. It's time to go, I said to the remaining survivors as we unlocked the doors. Death had quickly become a fateful companion on our mission, but if we could warn Earth, it would be worth it. There are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to the agonizing death you'd meet if faced with the vacuum of space. If an astronaut's suit should fail, exposing them to the vast emptiness around, how long would it take before they finally die? Would their blood boil over, or would they simply explode with nothing around them to withstand the body's internal pressure? Perhaps they might just freeze to death. Fortunately, those are not the case. The body can withstand a lot more than one might think. Liquids won't boil if inside a closed system, nor can anything freeze quickly. Heat cannot easily escape our bodies without something to conduct towards. In reality, an astronaut's death in space is a horrifying but quick process. Once faced with the eternal darkness of space, there is no hope left of survival. There are only a few natural orifices on the human body. First, the air is sucked out from your lungs. No matter how hard you try to hold your breath, it's simply a futile task, and they collapse within seconds. Then, whatever contents that was once passed slowly through your digestive tract is forced out. After about 15 seconds of exposure, you lose consciousness, but not before feeling the saliva in your mouth boil over and the vessels in your eyes rupture. Then, with soiled pants and a fading mind, your body suffocates, and your body is destined to drift through space, unable to rot until the end of time. These were the thoughts that preoccupied my mind each time I put on my suit for any extravehicular activity. Only then, the hostile territory wouldn't be space, nor the surface of the moon, but our own base. It had been plunged into a vacuum as the monsters invaded, and we could only pray that anyone else had survived. During any regular spacewalk, we'd have our communication channels to comfort each other. But with the invaders hijacking our radios to kill us, we had little choice but to wander in silence. Nothing, say, a small whiteboard to deliver simple messages. The four of us, rifles in hand, headed towards Section 5. It had been the main hub to organize an evacuation, but following the miserably failed autopsy of the first invader, we lost contact. Fearing the worst, we could do little more than check up on them. Jennifer scribbled something down on the whiteboard and held it up in front of us. Shortcut, this way. Being unable to respond, we had no choice but to follow Jennifer's orders. She brought us through a service airlock that hadn't been used since the construction of Ares, but at least it would allow us to bypass most of the alien riddled hallways. Once we got outside and onto the moon's surface, we were faced with dozens of new pods. Each had housed an invader, but now they were nowhere in sight. We kept our eyes peeled as we sneaked towards Section 5's service entry. Our theory thus far had been that the invaders tracked us through radio signals, 
but whether they could still find us without remained an unanswered question. Guns ready, Jennifer wrote on the whiteboard as we got ready to walk inside. I held my breath in anticipation, deafened by the sound of my suit's fan. On the intermittent occasion that it stopped, I could feel and hear my own internal organs churning, beats of my racing heart and the blood rushing through my arteries. As we opened the airlock, we expected a rapid flow of air escaping the middle compartment, yet we were faced with another vacuum. I felt my stomach drop as I was hit with the realization that Section 5 might have gone under. We raised our weapons, ready to face whatever monstrosities lay on the other side. The door opened and what we were faced with didn't even resemble Ares at all. The entire section had been terraformed, and the air had been replaced by an empty vacuum. The walls were covered in what looked like charred remains of bluish flesh, and on the ground lay mangled body parts seeming to belong to both our own crew and the aliens. I checked the room for an explanation and quickly found a massive hole in the section's hull. In a last ditch attempt, someone had blown up the section, hoping to kill as many invaders as possible, but there were no survivors. Despite their heroic efforts, there were still hundreds of invaders roaming the rest of Ares. Jennifer rushed to the central control panel, miraculously booting it up, while the rest of us secured the area. Without a single word to mourn our friends and co-workers, we got to work. Our first task would be to contact ground control and alert them to the oncoming threat of utter destruction. Our lives seemed painfully insignificant compared to the fate of Earth. Alas, the few satellites we could use to contact home were either out of range or had been destroyed during the invasion. Without any means of communication, we would have to warn them ourselves, which meant evacuating the station. But before any attempted escape, we had to find any remaining survivors aboard Ares. I begged internally that someone had escaped, but deep inside I knew it was little more than childish hope. We attempted to track any familiar heat signature through the system. It was a slow process to filter out the numerous invaders, but we waited patiently, hoping they wouldn't find us. There were a few crew members in the section who'd managed to get their suits on before the slaughter. Daniel went to each and diligently checked for signs of life, but just like the rest of the crew, they'd perished in the explosion. Standing guard without aid of my own hearing was a horrible task. I periodically glanced back at Jennifer, checking to see if she'd made progress with the computer. Despite not being able to see her face through the helmet, I could tell by her body language that the news wouldn't be good. She was quickly losing the last ounce of hope that she had left. After a painful few minutes, she held up the whiteboard. 154 invaders, she wrote. I stared at her in a mixture of shock and awe not knowing what or how to respond. Instead, I just pointed at the many corpses littering the section, hoping she'd get the gist of my question. She cleaned the whiteboard and wrote a single digit back on it. Zero. I shrugged as to ask what our next plan would be. The factory, she wrote in response. The factory had been our weapons testing facility, a few clicks away from the main base. At the time of the invasion, it hadn't been manned for weeks. It was simply a research station used on the rare occasion that we actually had to try out any new technology. Despite that fact, it had several escape vessels, but what Jennifer wanted with the station remained an unanswered question. At the very least, it might not have been taken over. The fact that no radio signals had been emitted from there in the absence of any crew means the aliens could have let it be. Then Jennifer shot to her feet and frantically pointed at the computer screen. It seemed that our activity in Section 5 had attracted some unwanted attention from the invaders and they were heading straight for us. We immediately started retreating back towards the airlock, hoping that we could get out before they saw us. Alas, we were too late, and the monstrosities were too quick. Five of them entered, just staring at us in confusion. They didn't seem to understand how we could resist their hypnotic sound and radio waves. Without hesitation, we opened fire on them and slowly walked backwards towards the exit. Once the invaders realized we could fight back, they charged at us with impressive speed. John stood before us, putting three rounds in one of them with absolute precision. It seemed to knock it out, if only temporarily, but he'd stopped just long enough for one of them to grab him. John! I foolishly called out, forgetting that he couldn't hear me. It was too late. No sooner had they touched him before he pointed the weapon at himself and pulled the trigger. The bullet ripped through his abdomen and blood spurted out through the hole lingering temporarily in the vacuum before starting to boil. Regardless of the bullet itself, the vacuum would kill him in under a minute. We could do nothing but keep firing as we pulled back into the airlock. 
Unable to help him, we closed the airlock, giving him one final look of pity as his blood boiled in the harsh vacuum of space. Take a look outside your window. Gaze upon the beauties the world beholds. The trees, the skies, the laughter of children. They walk around, ignorant of the fact that their world might end at any given moment. It could happen in less than a second, while you sleep peacefully at night and you'd never even realize it. Imagine yourself driving home from work. A brief flash fills the sky, an instance of surprise, and then... nothing. The world ends, leaving no trace of life behind. That's how a gamma ray burst would appear. A vast source of energy created by colliding stars millions of light years away. On the other hand, false vacuum could extinguish all life in the universe just as easily, collapsing beneath the rules of physics, erasing everything humanity has ever been or could be. We wouldn't be able to stop it. Solar flares, black holes, or even a reversal of the magnetic poles, the universe is an endless, merciless, horrific void filled with uncertainty. Our place in it is absolutely insignificant. We are but parasites lingering in a hostile bubble, ready to burst at any given moment, yet we never take a moment to appreciate our luck. Every breath might be your last, so make sure it's worthwhile. Those were the words that raced through my mind as I watched John fall lifelessly to the ground, dead by his own hands. They were the words spoken by my old professor, a genius with a nihilistic personality, making sure we all knew just how fragile life truly is. John had given his life for us, standing his ground as aliens charged, yet they only needed a simple touch to end his existence. We ran through the airlock, sealing it on our way to make sure nothing else could get through ever again. Once back on the moon's surface, we had to walk around Ares and travel three hours just to get back to the factory. We couldn't even use the buggy, lest we want to get detected by its automatic tracking system. It had been two hours since we started our EVAs, but with our modern tanks, we could easily last eight hours before running out of oxygen, leaving us with an ample amount of time to get going if we were lucky. The factory still had a functioning life support system, despite having been offline for the past two years. We walked slowly, exhausted from the combat and subsequent escape. Despite gravity being only a sixth of that on Earth, our suits made movement difficult, and in the process of fleeing, Jennifer had dropped the whiteboard, leaving us with no means of communication. Night had long since taken over the surface of the moon, plunged it into eternal darkness, the picturesque view most think astronauts have, with the Earth shining brilliantly in the background, was not one that we had the privilege of witnessing. Since Ares had the backside of the moon, we had a little more than tiny stars filling up the sky, barely providing enough light to illuminate the dark, barren landscape before us. If nothing else, at least the darkness could provide us cover during our escape. Two hours passed and we inched our way closer to the factory, our path barely lit up by our weak flashlights purposefully set low to avoid detection. By then, we could just barely see the peak of the factory's observation tower, and we knew we were getting close. As we took a break to admire the magnificently tall structure, we noticed something drifting across the sky, barely visible in the darkness of space. It was another drop pod. It shot down, creating a minor crater on impact. Like the others, it had an obsidian black capsule and multiple massive blisters, each seeming to contain an invader. I gave the others a final glance, reassuring them that we would hold our ground until the very end. With nowhere else to run, we didn't have any other options. The first blisters burst, a slimy liquid tried to trickle down, boiling and evaporating before it could even hit the ground. One of the aliens crawled out and got to his feet. Without hesitation, we opened fire, putting multiple rounds into both its head and torso. After about 15 shots, we finally brought it down. Before we could react, the remaining five blisters ruptured and more monstrosities crawled out. That time, we didn't even wait for the liquid to clear before we started firing upon them. On Earth, the spectacle would have been loud enough to rupture eardrums and alert the enemy from miles away, yet on the moon, murder was a silent process. Any sound originating within the chambers of our rifle was quickly quelled as it met the empty vacuum outside. The only thing we could hear were the vibrations propagating through our own bodies shaking violently with each pull of the trigger. With limited ammunition, it wasn't long before we ran out. Two aliens, both riddled with bullets, kept charging at us. 
I hit one with the butt of my rifle and shoved it to the ground. I kept hitting it where it lay, not stopping for a second until it resembled a little more than a pile of minced meat. The second one that managed to prevail through the hail of bullets charged at Daniel. It grabbed upon his torso with its massive arms. Within a second, Daniel had fallen victim to their control and pointed his weapon at himself before pulling the trigger. Nothing happened. His gun was empty. Once his first option failed, Daniel attempted to rip his spacesuit apart. An impossible task, luckily unknown to the alien, both Jennifer and I ran to the creature and pummeled it to the ground, smashing its horrific body with our empty rifles, not stopping until it died. Daniel had been freed, but in the process he fell unconscious. We quickly investigated his limp body for any injuries or holes in the suit, but apart from his untimely slumber, he appeared fine. We looked at each other, realizing we'd have to carry him the rest of the way. I'd never been so thankful for low gravity. The rest of the factory came into view shortly after, an impressive structure full of empty hallways and failed experiments, most classified above my own clearance. It had been abandoned after the development of the PAW stations. They were the best our technology had to offer, and yet, they'd been eliminated within the first hour of the invasion. Our failsafe and humanity's last hope against the inevitable end had been destroyed. We entered through the airlock as I carried Daniel on my back. What lay ahead of us was a massive network of hallways, expertly organized to keep anything confidential out of sight. In an absence of a maintenance crew, the station had fallen dark, with only a minimal amount of emergency lights to guide our way. Unfortunately, the life support had been turned off in our absence, meaning we had to rely on the constantly diminishing oxygen supply still within our suits. The factory, like Ares, had effectively lost its atmosphere. Of course, there were tanks of oxygen spread across the station by each airlock, but we would still be confined to our suits while we worked. Both Jennifer and I had been stationed there during our tenure aboard Ares. However, I suspect that she knew more about the station than I did, as she guided us through the long hallways without an ounce of doubt. After several twists and turns, we ended up in a massive control room. It was dark, and every system had been deactivated to preserve power. Jennifer searched the room and quickly found a notepad and pen. She grabbed it and jotted down a single word. Faraday. Then she clicked her radio on, and I put Daniel down onto one of the chairs, making sure he still had enough oxygen available. With mild trepidation, I turned my own radio on, and for the first time since we left the laboratories back at Section 3, we could talk to each other. Each major station here is built within a Faraday cage. Nothing can get in or out without being connected to the mainframe. We should be fine as long as we're just using our suit's radio systems. Alright, so you mind telling me what we're actually doing here? Shouldn't we get off the moon to warn Earth? I don't know if we can. How come? According to the records back at Section 5, two shuttles attempted to evacuate, but none even made it off of the surface. These creatures must be tracking our systems. I figured we might stand a better chance here. But still... Do we have any chance at all? She sighed. <sighs> Maybe. But there's something we have to do first. What do you mean? Did they ever tell you about a project called... The Last Resort? I immediately knew what the project entailed. It was something I'd read about during my initiation, back when it had been little more than rumors and whispers. Just a theory none of us ever believed would come to fruition. As I processed the shock, Daniel started to wake up. He quickly noticed us talking and turned on his own radio. So, we're talking now? Are we safe? I shook my head. Not yet, but they can't hear us here. That's a relief. I was about to go crazy. Jennifer interrupted. None of that matters anymore. It's time. Time for what? We're going to blow up Ares. There will come a time when the last word is spoken by the last human left alive. A moment heard by none to be forgotten by time itself. There will come a time where love dies and the last heart stops beating, one final embrace before death takes us apart, and one last kiss to say goodbye. Humanity, for all of its worth, will perish like so many other species before us. We will fight it tooth and nail, but no matter the case, our time will eventually come. There will come a time where all hope seems lost, but we will not give up, because our lives and the lives of those we love are worth fighting for. 
as we prepared for our last mission, I recounted the events of the past day. Something about the situation didn't sit right with me. We'd been monitoring the oncoming invasion for the past 50 years, yet we'd completely missed its imminent arrival. It doesn't make any sense. I whispered to myself, forgetting everything would be broadcast to the others. What doesn't? Their numbers. We counted, what, about 150 signatures aboard Ares? A weirdly small force that arrived five years ahead of schedule. But how do you explain that? The ship we detected back in 1970 was the size of the entire United States, but it's not here. What are you saying? Daniel chimed in. What if this is just a scout party? What if the main invasion is still five years away? If they're all confined within Ares and we blow it up, it should give us enough time to make it back to Earth and warn them. My words, though meant to comfort, hardly brighten the mood. If a scout party took out the best we had to fight them, I'm afraid we're utterly screwed. At least we would know how they operate. If anything, I'd say that's the best advantage we could possibly have gotten. We need to make it back to Earth. It was a simple enough plan in theory, but even if we managed to blow up Ares, it wouldn't ensure that every single alien died in the blast. So, the last resort, what is it? Daniel asked. You know how Nikola Tesla worked on the wireless transfer of electricity? Daniel nodded. Well, it's like that, except weaponized. It was supposed to be a device that irreversibly damaged electrical systems by overcharging them. Harmless to people. But it could render any enemy's station useless. Unfortunately, it had the same side effect of blowing everything to pieces. So we repurposed it as a measure of last resort should anything take over Ares. Better than killing everyone with nukes, I suppose. Don't worry, we have those too, but let's not kill ourselves while we still stand a chance. I shot back. In the end, we knew at least one of us had to escape, to get a warning out to Earth. If we could kill any of these bastards in the process, that was just a bonus. Before we could fire the weapon, we need to restore the facility's power. Jennifer would take that task and head for the basement. Once there, she could redirect any power from the neighboring stations and funnel it into the last resort. In the meantime, Daniel and I would climb the observation tower from where the last resort could be controlled. Once activated and Ares had been destroyed, we could retreat to the main hangar and pray that any of the escape shuttles still remained functional. Screw it. Let's not die today, Daniel said. Once we leave this room, we can't communicate anymore. Should they hijack our channels, we're done for. We need to maintain total radio silence for the next few hours, no matter what happens. I ordered. They nodded and quickly turned off their radios. It was time to re-enter the silent vacuum outside. No sooner had I turned my own radio off before I regretted not speaking any words of comfort. For all I knew, these could have been our last words ever spoken. We left the control room, equipped with little more than some papers and pens. Jennifer instantly ran to the lower levels while Daniel and I headed for the elevator that led up towards the observation tower. With the power mostly out, the elevator didn't run, which meant we had to move up the ladder within the shaft itself. It was an exhausting climb, despite the lower gravity. We made slow progress, but determined to save ourselves and Earth, we eventually got there. Daniel gave me a look, not knowing what to do. His face was wet from sweat, both from nervousness and exhaustion. I gave him a set of basic instructions, just which switches should be on and which off. He diligently followed orders while I started to reprogram the weapon. While its basic functions were active, we had to wait for Jennifer to turn the power back on before we could initiate the firing sequence. Half an hour quickly passed and I started to get nervous. Another ten minutes and I was about ready to go looking for her. As I jotted down an explanation to Daniel, I noticed one of the lights turn green, alerting us that the power had returned. Without hesitation, we started the firing sequence and counted down the seconds until activation. Even from the observation tower, we could just barely see the peak of Ares, a place where hundreds of great lives and trillions of unimportant dollars had been lost. It had all been for nothing. Then the weapon finally charged. Ready? I wrote down on a piece of paper. He nodded and we fired the weapon. For a moment, I feared that Ares was too rid of oxygen to ignite in the blast, but these doubts were quickly stifled as a massive explosion emerged over the horizon. Tons of debris shot up from the moon's surface, powerful enough to escape orbit. A few seconds later, the ground beneath us rumbled. Shockwaves couldn't travel through a vacuum, but the explosion itself had been enough to shake the ground. Holy hell, I could see Daniel mouth silently. I attempted to scan Ares for any identifiable heat signatures and radio signals. But in the wake of the explosion, 
I could only get a static-like image that proved impossible to read. There was no way to know how many aliens survived the explosion, but I knew that whatever was left, they'd head straight for us. We evacuated the tower. Luckily, the elevator had been activated alongside the rest of the station, meaning we didn't have to climb down. It was a minor victory, but it came with the downside of re-establishing atmosphere. With the power returned, we knew it was only a moment before the generators down in the basement produced an effective atmosphere. Soon we'd be able to breathe and hear. By all measurable metrics, time was running out. The hangar in the facility was filled with experimental vehicles, most only used for local travel and none helpful in our escape. Despite that, the factory was equipped with several escape shuttles, two of which were still docked. Back on Earth, common fuel only has a shelf life of about three to six months. Kerosene fuel, on the other hand, can last years without degrading, and the factory had plenty of it. Once we got down there, I started the fueling process. Still, Jennifer was nowhere in sight. Once the process of refueling had started, I took to the control panel and scanned for any signs of life in the vicinity. In the distance, only a mile away, I could see dozens of creatures approaching us. Shit! I shouted, the words only echoing within my own suit. We still needed an hour to fuel, and based on the invader's speed, they'd be here in just shy of that. The hour slowly ticked down, and by each passing minute, our deaths approached. I couldn't risk waiting any longer, so I signaled for Daniel to stay put while I went to search for Jennifer. Based on her signature, I tracked her to the basement of the facility, running around erratically. I rushed through the dimly lit halls, slowly starting to hear the echoes of my own footsteps. By then, the atmosphere was almost fully restored. The basement was a massive room filled with generators converting moon dust to breathable oxygen. Jennifer was moving from generator to generator, deactivating them in an attempt at stopping air from being produced. She wasn't even wearing a helmet anymore. I approached her, noticing that each pillar next to the generators had been mounted with explosive charges. We need to stop them! She shouted as she noticed my presence. I took my own helmet off, letting in a breath of stale air. We're about to leave! Come on! It's too late. They're almost here. We need to bring the station down with us. I glanced at the charges, noticing a timer slowly ticking down. Within the next hour, the station would blow, and unless we could escape, we'd be disintegrated with it. How'd you even find these? I used to work here, remember? Now put your helmet back on. I'm about to evacuate the air from this place. With that, the atmosphere once again vanished, and we were plunged into everlasting silence. We left the basement and rushed back to the shuttle, which was still ten minutes away from being ready. As I prepared the craft, the others stood in uncomfortable silence. We all knew that the station could be overrun at any moment, yet we had no weapons nor numbers to fight back with. I glanced over at the control panel, the blips on the radar growing ever closer. Then we felt it, the station shaking as the first set of doors blew open. We were still not ready to leave. We looked at each other, doubt and fear on all of our faces. Then another shake as a second set of doors were breached. They were getting closer. In less than five minutes, they'd be upon us. How long? Jennifer jotted down on the paper. I held up my hand, showing that we still needed five more minutes before we could launch. I looked at the door, wondering when it would blow open and the monstrosities would barge in to end us. I knew what had to be done. Someone had to lead them away from the hangar, trick them into another part of the station. As I turned around, I saw Daniel inside the shuttle, detaching a portable radio from the dashboard. He'd made the same realization as myself and was going to sacrifice himself. I tried taking it from him, but he pushed me away and rushed for the doors. Before they closed, I could see him flick the radio on, creating a mess of radio signals that would attract the aliens. Since it wasn't the one built into his suit, they wouldn't be able to control him. He started running in the opposite direction of the hangar, and the aliens followed diligently. Jennifer and I boarded the shuttle hesitantly and immediately got it running. She pointed back in the direction Daniel had run, but it was pointless. He'd given us an opportunity, and if we didn't take it, we'd perish alongside him. We shot through the evacuation tunnel, gathering enough speed to easily escape the moon's weak and unstable gravity. Even then, we couldn't speak until the oxygen levels rose within the shuttle. All we could do was stare out the window and wait for the charge to detonate. There couldn't be much of a blast to speak of. Without oxygen to carry the fire, the station simply collapsed as the beams evaporated killing anything still within. Daniel had saved our lives and taken down what remained of the scout party in the process. Once at a safe distance, we finally removed our helmets but kept the radio off. We made it, Jennifer said with a somber tone of voice.
It was a bittersweet victory, and I let out a sigh of both sadness and relief. We'd failed to protect Earth, and Ares had been taken out by a simple scout party. It was only thanks to the heroism of our fallen friends that we were given a chance to warn Earth. We survived the first wave, but as previously suspected, a much larger force will reach us in the next five years. With the current technologies and the multiple wars we fight amongst ourselves back on Earth, we don't stand a chance. This will be our last stand, and the only hope of victory we have is to stand together as one.